and discipline come to mind. So let's do one. So I think right when you say, um, when when you are you when you mention the series, and then I can say yeah, and, and I'll talk about how it's also a part of the Living Writers series. Okay. And then I'll kind of just talk about the Audre Lorde quote. Mm-hmm. Although, are, are we going to read our bio? I was going to read your bio. So I'll read your bio too. Okay, so we'll start with um, this. I have. We'll start with. um, This description uh, of first collaborating on discipline or will be with Dr. Dr. Ronaldo V. Wilson, Professor of Creative Writing and Literature at UC Santa Cruz. Dr. Wilson is the author of Narrative of the Life of Brown Boy, and so list those things. Mm-hmm. And um, he joins us in the collaboration between uh, SFSU right. and UC Santa Cruz. And then I'll say something, and, and then once you say that, I'll say, you know, and, very happy to introduce Dr. Tanya Foster, who's the interlocutor, but also the kind of, you know, I'll start there and I'll read your bio. I'll talk okay. a little bit about the series and I'll read your bio. Okay. So apparently we have to pull the mics. Okay. I'm going to just give you the mic and we'll just stand so they can Okay. Okay. Test, 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 test. It's actually better. I know. <laughs> yes? Okay. Yes. Yes? Yes. Yeah, it's better, right? Okay. Tanya M. Foster here from San Francisco State University. Hey. George and Judy Marcus, Chair in Poetry. And our friend and fellow poet and um, longtime correspondent with the Poetry Center is yeah. Ronaldo V. Wilson, who has died in UC Santa Cruz. Woo-hoo. So, um, mm-hmm. and I'm going to say to people, um, well, I guess it doesn't matter. Everybody should be at the at the YouTube live stream right now. We've, we've we're unable to make the connection through the webinar, so we're, we've moved to a YouTube live stream, and this will be recorded, and a recording will be available. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. They're saying they're not hearing anything on the, on the live stream. They're stream. not hearing anything on the live stream. That's the news I get from my... So there's word outside coming in <laughs> that we're not going out. <laughs> Okay, audio is coming up, I'll I'll just say. Um, One, two, three, do the strangers hear on the other side? Let me know by text, we're waiting. Can you hear? Is. Yes, so you're getting news they can hear. You can hear us. Yes, yes, I also have a, a, an, a, an affirmative, so folks can hear. Really interesting. Mm-hmm. I, <laughs> I, I had planned to use your quote later, but I think the improvisatory is not an accident. <laughs> um, it's necessary. It is necessary, and it's right on time. And the second part of that quote is its purpose is to realign sensibility. So I hope that our conversation will be um, in tune with whatever the frequency is we had to reach to go through the things that we did. I want to welcome you. Um, I'm really delighted to be here with Ronaldo and to be in conversation with him over many years. I want to say thank you for, this is the first um, 
in a series called Undisciplining the Fields. And it's a series that's imagined as a conversation, readings, per sometimes performance series that invites poets, writers, artists, filmmakers, and scholars from a range of fields to discuss and share their cross-disciplinary practices and their thinking um, and to share their work. I started this, and this kind of came out of certainly conversations with Ronaldo over the years, who um, one part of this series, in my thinking, is about the kind of relations that we have mm -hmm. that are not so professionalized that they don't attend to those things outside of the institution. And so Ronaldo is one of those creative thinkers and beings and persons whom I've known since grad school um, and who prodded me through in ways that are incredible. And it's been remarkable seeing his work um, over the years, how all the sort of iterations and evolutions that have happened. Uh, Dr. Wilson is the author of Narrative of the Life of the Brown Boy and the White Man from University of Pittsburgh Press. It was winner of the Cave Canem Poetry Prize. He's the author of Poems of the Black Object, um, from which he'll read today, winner of the Tom Gunn Award for Gay Poetry, which always seems like a weird addendum. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, and the Asian American Literary Award in Poetry. He, he's the author of Farther Traveler, um, Poetry, Prose, and Other, which am I allowed to say? The edition, the new edition. Sure. Oh, for Farther Traveler. For yes. Sure. Mm -hmm. That there will be a new edition. And I already kind of let the cat out of the bag. But a new edition is forthcoming. It was also a finalist for the Tom Gunn Award. Um, and Lucy, 72. Um, his latest books are Carmelina Figures and Virgil Kills, a collection of short stories. Um, he's co-founder of Black Took Collective. Wilson is an interdisciplinary artist he has presented his work in multiple venues across the country, around the world. Um, and he is a professor at UC Santa Cruz. And this series is actually done in collaboration with UC Santa Cruz, which has a living writer series. Yes, and I'm so excited to be here with Tanya at SFSU. And um, I couldn't be more thrilled to um, imagine with you and to, to, to change the ways in which institutions might bear this kind of conversation. This is also a part of our, our series called the Living Writers Series at UC Santa Cruz. And um, the series that I'm curating is called Conversations Power Forged. And perhaps as a kind of corollary to the field study, performance, and recreation or recreation. I'd like to offer what is a hinge for our series. Um, the poet and activist Audre Lorde, who describes that raw and powerful connection from which our power is forged. Okay. Difference is how she describes difference between legacies, institutions, families, embodiments, and homes across race, gender, sexuality, and class. Guests, like I'm a guest here, you're a guest. <laughs> We're a Say guest it. in cyberspace. Yeah. We're a guest in this room, guests with one another, guesting and gusting with one another um, for many, many years. And I think we've always been in a kind of conversation, mm -hmm. intense conversations over the years. Um, I remember this time in graduate school, the kitchen in particular, yeah. one of my most vivid conversations with Tanya, we're just starting out and suddenly I remember I turned my head and all of a sudden all of this, I think it was um, V8, 
spilled on the floor and saturated the, the, you know, the, the New York, Brooklyn apartment. And it was this moment, and I, and it was, I was so scared because I, the conversation was so deep. And, and that I remember the viscous you know, sensation there, and I, and I knew it was, it was having this brilliant friend, but also having a kind of um, the forged power of, of both love and fear and the actual trembling you know, in the conversation. And I, I think of that um, by way of Tanya Foster's um, bio, Dr. Foster is a poet, essayist, and black feminist scholar. She's the author of A Swarm of Bees in the High Car Court. You're going to have to pronounce this for me, the bilingual chapbook, because, you know, I don't want to butcher it. <laughs> Just do it. La Grammaire des Os. La, La Grammaire. No, it's, it's beautiful. La, La Grammaire des Os. Des Os and co-editor of Third Mind, Teaching Creative Writing Through Visual Art. Her writing and research focuses on poetry, poetics, idea, place, and emplacement, and on intersections between the visual and the written, which is very true. Dr. Foster is a poetry editor at Fence Magazine and a member of the San Francisco Writers Grotto. I love these titles that are coming out. Forthcoming um, publications include Thingifications, Ugly Duckling Press. Do you say A Hot B? A History of the Bitch, or A-H-O-T-B, <laughs> a hot B. It varies. I love it. I love that. Like uh, I say a hot B. <laughs> oh, a hot B. Because then it's a hot B. Ain't she a hot B? Ain't she a hot B, or a History of the Bitch. Mm -hmm. Anthologies, <laughs> the Umbra Galaxy, Wesleyan, a two-volume mm -hmm. compendium of Umbra Writers Workshops, which I'm hoping yeah. it to be in. And we're also co-editing... Uh, an anthology um, with M.G. Dufresne um, called New Writing, uh, New, Flesh. New Flesh, an anthology from Night Boat Books of Experimental Creative Drafts of Folks of Color. Um, Tanya is a 2021 Lisa Goldberg Fellow at the Radcliffe Institute at Harvard, a Creative Capital Awardee and recipients of awards from McDowell, Headland Center for the Arts, New York Foundation for the Arts, San Francisco Museum of the African Diaspora. No, I want to read them all because I'm so interested in, we were talking about awards earlier. Well, we were talking about who's a couture poet. Yeah. He is a couture poet. There are some poets, now, and as opposed to a Walmart poet. I and like so I was saying, like, what's the distinction? Mm. Well, there are many people at Walmart who would love couture. But it seems expensive, but it's actually for people at Walmart. Some people on the other, oh, this is terrible. I can't believe I'm saying this. Well, I am saying it in public. What can I say? I am impolite. <laughs> um, but you're such a, a fantastic poet. And one of, the, one of the many things that came up in class discussion yesterday was how um, you don't turn away from the discomforting. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I want to sort of hold that space of the impolite and also the, the kind of um, excavation of the award because I'm also thinking about um, the endowed chair position here, the, the Judy Marcus, George and Judy Marcus endowed chair position in relationship to you know, the position, I think it's a really amazing thing that the study of what can get from, I'm looking at these lists and thinking we can talk about the space of creative capital, the space of the Radcliffe as a kind of, a, as a kind of award which signifies time and the labor of fabrics that go into, you know, making, right? So there is, there is a kind of insistence in maybe the, uh, maybe the impolite or the polite also to be really crude and rude and to, to sort of open up the idea of time. And so I, I think maybe... You don't let me turn away, do you? No, because you remember the... I'm thinking the V8 spill. It was like a V8 engine of dismay on linoleum. There's also tenderness in that. Like, I can mm -hmm. think of times that you pulled me away from what you knew was hurting me. Mm. And that it was this incredible kind of tenderness, too. 
And so it's funny that that, I think about the discomfort in your work, that that discomfort is about attending to something larger. And that even if we look, if we look at the, the um, you know, the V8 spill, that there is a sensibility and a sensitivity to feel what all of that, all the energy that was in that and around that, and that that's apparent in your work. Oh, thank you. Thank you for saying that, because the word that comes to mind is recognition. Mm -hmm. You know, what it means to recognize a fellow traveler working in the business of, of offering you know, multiple ways of seeing, mm -hmm. right? I see you. Maybe, maybe I was pulling myself closer by pulling you away. Maybe I was pulling myself also away, but closer to what? You know, closer to privacy, closer to the quiet. I want to um, intervene um, a bit. And I was so struck, uh, you know, Tanya visited my advanced poetry workshop. And the students were, of course, you know, stunned and just, you know, in, deeply invested in, in, in the thinking. And I, I love this passage in the essay that you sent us ta from Time, Memory, and Living in Shotgun Houses in the South of the South City of New Orleans. I love this quote because I think it speaks to this um, idea of the kind of approximations of recognition that maybe, you know, promise the award, um, the reward. You write, to listen closely which is an important part of the poet's shtick, is not so much to sing as it is to reach after song, to reach after the rhythmic worm working through the ear, which is a burrow or borrow, borrow in the mind. Burrow and borrow Manhattan, Brooklyn, borrow bearing. That's me just saying out loud what the spelling is. In the mind, back to Dr. Foster. That space of the psychological and effective, this space holds sonic and visual and gestural and syntactic residue from what has come before and is part of the constellation of what is at the same time that it portends what may follow. And you, I mean, I'm so interested in that. I mean, I guess I love this conversation about the rend, mm -hmm. what's rendered, what's made in the process of poet making, in the process of study. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I would love to hear m more in this conversation from you around that, you know. And I guess I was hoping to hear from you. I, when, when we, as we've talked about this, I've thought about the sort of fields and disciplines that we're schooled in. Mm. And so, and that we're trained in. I have to keep, I have to remember to keep this up. So the fields that we're trained in and the discipline that we're, we're sort of beholden to in some ways. And so I thought, what is one, what is the field encircling and what is the field leaving out? And so for me, there are so many things in the institutional space. And you know, I realized that I did not give, say thank you to George and Judy Marcus and the, for this opportunity. This is incredible. It's th through their support that we have this conversation. And to the Poetry Center, to Steve and Jonathan and Daly for making this happen. Um, and Elise, of course. Um, so I want to say the thank you first, or go back to that thank you, because I think there's something about acknowledging mm -hmm. what encircles and makes possible what happens in the space of the field or the discipline or the institution. And so, does that make sense? Mm -hmm. You look like you have a question. Angelina, behind you. <laughs> oh, sorry, audience. I guess you had to be here. Um, just kidding. I'm glad you're there. Um, 
No, so my thinking is just, I wanted to not forget to, to acknowledge those who are not in the room, who are important, and those who are in the room, who are important to making possible what you're seeing here, right, and the conversation that you're hearing. And I mention that because Ronaldo's question um, about, I'm assuming you were pointing me to field and discipline. I am. I, but I, I, love, I, I love what you're saying, though. I mean, I love what you're doing in terms of, you know, in theory, right? One of the ways, I think, in graduate school that was a little bit, um, I don't know if it was disturbing, but there was often, I don't remember this phrase in graduate school in the PhD program, oh, you're taking a back door and getting to Foucault or Fanon or whatever. Oh, that's a back door. <laughs> It is. Right? I mean, which but you got to take the back door. Well, it's, it's the more, most interesting route. It's it's so interesting in in relationship to what you call the kind of shotgun the, the shotgun house mm -hmm. and also the burrow burrow, but also what it means to acknowledge and you feel it, right? Like what it means to say I want to thank the sponsors, but to feel the effect. You know, I I, I want to thank the UC SC Center for Racial Justice, the Pucknett Literary Endowment, the Porter Hitchcock Poetry Fund, the Lori Sane Endowment, the Humanities Institute, and Two Birds Books in Santa Cruz, which is right down the street from my house, <laughs> which are selling our works. But I actually think outside of the institute away, this is, a, this is in some ways what I hold on to. And I believe that that keeps me, you know, fed and, do you know what I mean? Like there's something really important to say you know, what does it mean to make a living in the field? And, and I think that's part of the encouragement. It's like, I don't want to be alone. I want you to make a living. I want to be able to, you know, practice as a writer. And, I, and part of it is these streams allow us, but it's so interesting to be away from the, in, the actual institution where I work, but in the space of the forged power the undisciplinary space, the recreation mm -hmm. as the site that allows for another kind of, um, you know, I feel relaxed, actually. Well, and it's good to feel relaxed. I mean, I'm also, the two questions I had that I had imagined beginning with was to ask you, what are your fields of study? What are your fields of interest? What are your fields of work, and what comes to mind when you think of discipline? Well, it's a good question. <laughs> it's a very good question because I will say the field I'm most concerned right now, with right now, and I have to thank my colleague in, in feminist studies, Gina Athena Ulysse, who is a, a gorgeous artist um, who works in performance and also anthropology as a discipline. Um, she responded this way when I told her that my mother's response to my father's um, recent passing was to rip up our lawn and to begin to farm. I mean, it's, it's the size of this. She's eight, well, if you're not looking, the room is probably, it's pretty big. What, you, what, what are the dimensions of this room? I would imagine, can we just get a dimension? 45. Yeah, it's about maybe 40 by 40. It's not, is that right? It's a, it's a fairly, you know, imagine a kind of, a, you know, a nice size ratio. My mother is probably like a mouse on a coffee table, <laughs> right? And in that scale, a middle-sized coffee table, you know, like a... And in that space, she, with a pitchfork and a knife, turned the soil over and began to plant tomatoes, you know, what through the summer. And it just blossomed. And it was very interesting because all of the family came to pick. She would say, my mother would still say, oh, get out there and work. And we're all working at all ages, little kids, old men, middle, you know, we're all like getting our, well, you know, getting our, and I just remember my, my feeling in that field was just to take photographs and then to begin to paint and work and witness that field because the formation of that field, that to me is the sort of 
actual shotgun digging, sort of squirreling away, theorizing at how do I deal with larger questions? Exile, loss. I'm saying exile. My mother's from the Philippines. Um, she left the Philippines. She married a black man, which didn't really sit well with her family in the Philippines. It was very, quite violent, so she left them all behind. But what does it mean to, to, to farm or parm? And I just thought, let me keep working with this. Let me keep working with this. And also the sort of genius of, of my mother at 84 years old to bring everyone home. And for us, and then we thought it was over. At when, when harvest was over, right? But my mother's like, I'm going to get that garden. I'm going to make this garden. So her impulse was to, now she has her fall vegetables. We go shopping at the, you know, we go shop. So field, I photograph everything my mother's doing. She's so interesting. All the angles, all, and I paint her hands, and I paint my hands, and I paint us in this world. I'm, I'm interested. One field is the excavation of the family portrait. So I'm working on a series of portraits that move through these very questions. And I think maybe that's ultimately what I've invested in. And you know, obviously, I'm influenced by many people, you among. But I think a kind of a kin writer to you is Gwendolyn Brooks. So I think for me, Gwendolyn Brooks's portraiture, sense of poetry is a portrait, portrait I'd say, even a painter. She's very painterly. Mm -hmm. that in, the relationship with that work as a poet, almost, I don't know, what is the word? I farm. I farm texts now. And I wouldn't have known that unless I talked about my mother. From I'm farming. I'm digging through the work. I don't get to read all the time. Sometimes I weep at the text. Sometimes it's hard. But I just feel what I'm reading. And what I'm reading, I'm making. I'm trying to figure out how do I communicate back to the other side. That is, I think, between, um, you know, between heaven and earth. Or below earth and above heaven, right? I'm interested in that, which is, you know, the, which is why Walmart's a difficult place for Ronaldo V. Wilson to exist, because it's, it's a box store. It's too difficult, right? I mean, but I think it's too big for me to figure out where I'm going. Well, um, there's such particularity in your work and such attention to the body, to the body in place, in space, in relation to others that that's also the kind of miraculous beauty. And not just beauty, because I, I often think that beauty seems like a cheap word, right? Um, in part because we don't consider the difficulty of beauty. Mm -hmm. And part of what, what you just did with the question of what is your field of study is you talked about the lived density of your experience and how it is, I, I'm, I'm, the only word I, that comes up for me at the moment is translated. But I actually don't think it's a translation. I think it's a transmutation. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And it's that transmutation of that experience into something else that has its own life that seems central to the work of the artist and central to your work as an artist. I mean, I've started trying, and this isn't on, but there are these incredible drawings you sent me and sketches. And um, I think of how these drawings move between, there is certainly the portrait that comes up, but then there are the gestures that are sort of more pronounced almost capturing a gesture. And the, even the gesture of drawing is a part of it. Um, and in the poems as well, there's that sense of really, God, I think bodies, you said what's below and above, but it's also bodies of language, mm -hmm. uh, bodies in terms of formal strategies in the work. Um, there's so much of that kind of transmutation happening. Yeah, I mean, I, it, is there a way to to show any images? There has to be a way. And I don't know. I want to make sure because I think it's it might be important if we're talking about images to to have them, right? We don't have to be shy, and you know, 
I'm I'm wondering if if the folks in YouTube land can see images. I'm just gonna. Can okay. you see? Because I, I, you know, I was I was so lucky to be in conversation with a, a number of of artists recently at the Center for African American Poetry and Poetics with Turquoise Dyson, uh, the uh, amazing um, sculptor and um, conceptual artist and painter. I actually, just talked about my work. I worked on a series of drawings. She worked in poetry. Um, and the sound artist Mendy and Keith Obadike, and also, and Dawn curated it, but it was this question around close reading of the emergency. Hmm. I would say, just in terms of Turquoise Dyson and, and my work, was just to kind of, she just said, look, just draw. Because, you know, she's been a, you know, I've had teachers, I would say, that I'm just trying to think of how to bring it back to this idea of, of, of form and formal practice. And I would say that there's something around the invitation. I keep going back to what it means to pull one aside. Troquasse Dyson was an artist who said, you can draw. And a serious artist, she's like, no, you draw, your drawings are outrageously good. And she was already at Yale. She was working in interesting ways. And it just encouraged me to keep making. And so these pieces are, are from a cycle of drawings from a course that I took with the um, painter and um, Printmaker uh, and conceptual artist thinker called Fred Liang, and there was a course called um, I was like drawing under pressure, a hundred drawings in four days, wow. and we just I just worked, and then later I don't know how far along we are in the slides, but so these these are just on paper, and then eventually I worked again with uh, Fred Liang in a printmaking course. And the sort of more recent works that I did with Turquoise, I don't know if they're here, are on mylar. But these are on paper. And so this one is important. So maybe going back to that piece, which is really a, a, a kind of tennis racket that's morphed and changed and rendered to a kind of body. But I'm really interested in, in the making of just trying to see like what happens. I will go from one shape to another. This is a, a painting that's. Um, done with uh, razors, exacto, exacto blades. And I don't know if you can keep, it, what happens is so, uh, over yeah. time, what happens is you begin to see um, one, uh, the, the form of the bodies that surface, which is a, a kind of a heart or a shape. And so moving through I realize. That's I awesome. I realize it's my. <laughs> but you get, I mean, really, really, uh, all I will say is what you're pointing to is that maybe even the tension of working as an artist in the, in, in the academy, right? Which is, how do you vacate language to get to the thing that matters, right? I mean, both of us are toggling between a kind of profession of working in theory you know, mm -hmm. cultural studies, that type of thing, but also making art. And the density of quiet and the density of, of a kind of maximal field making, you know, I'm interested in completely getting away from it all and getting back into it all to make, mm -hmm. to make fine art. Like I just make liking, I love making fine, beautiful, fine work. And I need a lot of quiet to do it. Like these are hard sketches. These are like my, my baby, my brother, who was my older brother, but suddenly I'm drawing him as a baby, and then it looks like me as a baby, and I'm like, oh, okay, and then maybe my, he's a bee, and like, how do I get to the bee drawing, and you know, what are the ways that I can kind of keep rendering, and then what is it about this sort of tube? Now, this is interesting because this is a composite of a niece that suddenly reminded me of your girl here, Wongechi Mutu's work. And one thing I learned from this, when I saw that, I realized, okay, I'm not in control of the work. And this is where I'll end, right? This part of the answer to the question is, at some point, you're not in control of what emerges in visual art because you're playing around with spirit and spirit life. It's not, the, because these are figures. And then you have to pay attention to these, these figures. And these figures are what someone like Turquoise Dyson's like, okay, I like that smudge. I like that face. Follow. And Fred Liang, follow that shape. Follow that. Um, 
So for me to have these relationships with fine artists who are dedicated to the smudge, the line, the blur, it complicates my relationship to poetry. How? How so? I think it, I think it gives me the, the sort of flexibility to say, you know, what really matters is not the, the tyranny of representation or the tyranny of form, but rather the tearing into it to make up the distance between, you know, I think about Audre Lorde's The Marvelous Arithmetics of Distance, mm -hmm. the sort of rigor of creating the, all of the moves that say, I am, to go back to Nurbezi Philip, like, I'm human, mm -hmm. I experiment, you know? And so the mechanisms, I, you know, I'm interested in, you know, I know why you like Wangechi Mutu, I, I could imagine, because of, of her attention to material, mm -hmm. her attention to home, place, Nairobi as a figure, her attention to um, commitments to touching, but also deep commitments to the field, not only in art making, but also in the field of what's possible between video. You're working multimodally too, mm -hmm. in performance, in video. Your poems, I think, are, you know, have a kind of paraperformative um, fissure that's always running through it. It's open, they're capacious, they're precise. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's wonderful for the work. I'm I'm immediately thinking it would be great if you could read from um, the dream, what's his name? Dream, oh, Dream in Affair. Dream in Affair, in part because I'm thinking about that phrase that um, student Mikey used, stream of unconsciousness, mm -hmm. but I'm also thinking of what you said just now about sort of moving away from the tyranny of representation to there's a way that the work I think gets at gets at an experience or a sensation or a feeling that actually can only be touched or felt through the formal practice that the poem enacts, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. And that the poem becomes a body that does not otherwise exist. Mm -hmm. And it's not just representing bodies in the world as we know it, but it's representing that space between that distance, that distance, those distances we traverse. And so that's also part of what the experience for me of seeing your, your visual work as well, mm -hmm. that it is, it's almost like this, like snapshot isn't quite it either. It's, it's, it's a flash, a flash of the spirit, mm -hmm. <laughs> right? That mm -hmm. flash of encounter, mm -hmm. that flash of something that is captured in the, in the time, space, continuum of the paper, or the paper, or the voice. Mm -hmm. That was a lot. But no, I mean, I, I, I love pondering, you know, the, the ways in which you are articulating, um, you know, potential, p potential surfaces, right, where, in the back of my mind, as I'm as I'm as I'm hearing you think through m my work or maybe our work, is are simple phrases like you know that we may take on within the institution as real, especially in the kinds of institutions maybe we work in. That maybe something like you know, race is a social a construct, mm -hmm. right? Or is it? You well, know, it has consequences. Exactly. Maybe at a at night, is it? it was the <laughs> Right, exactly. <laughs> There's a fleshiness to it that I think the kinds of the reverberations around the phrases that I think I, I, I think the field formation and I say field formation in terms of um, the kind of active subject thinking, whether on the run, mm -hmm. whether yes. you know what I mean, right? Mm-hmm. So I'm going to read a little bit of this poem called Dream and Affair, which was actually an important poem for me in, in um, Poems of the Black Object. It was very freeing for me to work in this form. 
I'll read it to the sound of the skateboards, the trucks. Dream in a fair. Nellie Olson's father is my brother. We're on a ship, a cruise, a tall one overlooking a parade. There is no water, although there is a street where a white pony jumps up on the hips of a clown. Since the horse is on a leash, it gets snagged and dragged to the floor. The horse is wet, its mane in the mud, and everyone laughs and cheers at its snag and drag. Alberto is in the dream. We never hang out, but he's on the deck, looking out at the street. We're asked to move, but we won't. The MC wants us to be in it, to sit in a pink pod. I wanted to stay put and look out from the couch on a cement balcony. There's a black man standing at the front of the line. He's a midget, and his teeth are yellow and gapped. He is short and muscular, but covers his body anyway with a costume. He's about to proceed as a dragon or a horse, something where only his black feet extend from the mane. You look up at a counter where a big, bald, black, who is your brother, lets you cut in front of the line. You order turkey on a plate with potatoes, a cup of water. In the dream, you are shadowed by time. Maybe you are out of time when you encourage Ms. Olson to buy a book. Mr. Olson wants no part of the book, but you look at the slim stacks of 20s in his wallet, and you are turned on that he is your protector too. You say, that book will be worth something in the future. Maybe it is that future you are rendering in the dream. In that present, you skip the line and look up at his face to see your big, bald, black brother now on a bench. He describes on the phone where he's going. He says, I've never been this far. And you want to say, what do you mean you've never been this far? Do you mean north or east? It is then you realize he has no sense of direction. And he kind of goes on around that, in that vein. So can I ask what about that? What was transformative for you? What was the release that, that writing this poem and writing in this way? Again, no, no, again, again, practice, again, consenting to, you know, I'm just going to really be attentive to my dreams over time. At a rough time, maybe mm -hmm. graduate school between, you know, books between jobs, between, you know, all kinds of things, East, West Coast, but just being attentive to just cataloging these dreams and, and the kind of confidence. I was reading Gwendolyn Brooks at the time. I wrote a dissertation around, um, was sort of the center point was Gwendolyn Brooks um, in thinking about Gwendolyn Brooks in relationship as a um, kind of primary figure through which to think about visual art culture, soon to be coming as a critical volume, but it's taken me so long. You know, this is, I was doing this work in 2000 or so. But, but it's taken time for the world to catch up with you, where Gwendolyn Brooks is concerned. Yeah, it's, I, I'm just getting glimpses, getting glimpses of, of, of what it means to, you know, really sit with confidence. And, you know, I think it's a report from part two, maybe one, the, the introductions to um, readers she has these beautiful, pithy introductions to writers that are sometimes, I mean, two or three sentences long. And I remember a recurring phrase in, in, in it's a poet with, you know, so like Stanley Kunitz is a poet with confidence. And I just remember thinking that, like, wow, what does it mean to have confidence? And I started to imagine what it might mean to have confidence as a poet in the material of the unconscious, mm -hmm. of the dream life, because my dreams are banging. I mean, I have like a rich, I have a rich life. And again, it's like the drawings, like I don't know where it comes from, but the only thing I can do is try to capture that, you know, it's like, it's like a free stream of cargo that's coming from my own history of being precious cargo. <laughs> it takes a certain kind of confidence or sense of self to believe that somehow your dreams matter, right? Yes. And that they're the things to attend to, or even that the sort of data dailiness of one's life is sufficient material 
to reflect on. And that's a hard, it seems to me that's a very um, remarkable space to be in and that maybe it's related. Now this is, who hmm. knows where this thought is going, but I, I think about the idea of being couture versus Walmart. Right, and that the expectation is that the couture is always desirable, mm. right? But the Walmart can be tossed aside. And so what happens if we had a, a sense of life that imagined that all life was couture? And so that deep attention and that tender care that the poet has to pay um, was sort of a strategy <laughs> for how to live ethically, actually. Yeah, that's exactly right. What do you do with um, one's training? Absolutely. Right? What do you do with, you know, unconscious, uh, consciously you know that there are effects, right? I mean, there are effects, and you say, as you say, there are true, there are consequences. There are consequences for bodies moving in space at different rates across culture, through languages, and, and some fare on the side of um, precarity, some don't, some move between them all. But what I was super fascinated with was like, I was thinking, yo, this is happening in my unconscious. I'm like, every possible permutation of massively detailed racialized, you know, so like scrimmage games were being played in my mind. Labels affixed to people, they were moving, like, why? Wait a minute, and this book in Virgil Kills, I was like, wait a minute, I have to do something about this crazy, amorphous, black, spider-like creature that's crawling around on the floor with a knife, a steak knife coming out of her back, stabbing, and then yet later they're crushed. I'm like, wait, what, what, why, why am I thinking that? You know, the rhetoric is, all lives matter, black lives matter, the quotidian, but somehow does that, that is something that I have to be attuned to. And now I realize that I, I've drawn that image unconsciously, but I'm rendering it in fiction. I have to be attentive to this because it's such a kind of weird, you know, the, the, I, I think the thing I'm also thinking about is, is training in the sense, I don't know, I'm obviously not a physician, my mother is a nurse, was a nurse's assistant. I could, I would, I could always go for her, go to her, you know, if I had whatever happening. I just knew. But I wonder about what it means to be trained in, say, critical race theory, or to be trained in feminist studies, or to be trained in, if you can't diagnose yourself, what is the problem? It's a problem if you can't figure out that, like, okay, I'm warped right now. Like, I am actually, my brain is morphed in such a way that I'm unleashing these unconscious avatars in my mind. If I don't address them somewhere, I'm not gonna be effective as a thinker. And also it's much more interesting in this way to communicate the kind of, um, the sort of unconscious stream. See, that's the confidence from your mom who turns the, <laughs> the yard, the space into a farm and from your father who was in the military. That's true. That's the confidence to be able to do that because actually many of us, and this is a, a, a Just video. Just playing at the beach. <laughs> I mean, you know, it's like, what am I going to do in the day, right? I have to figure out a way to write. I, I found this paper. I was working in, you know, um, I was working in Sharpies on this paper from India, this kind of parchment paper that I found in the studio. And it came alive when it was wet. It just became almost fluorescent because of the, but I wouldn't have never known unless I was working in printmaking and had to work in these sort of non-water soluble pieces. But that's just stunning. And that's interesting, it's compelling. And then that piece of paper becomes part of a collage. And, and those are actually, I'm washing these strange microaggressions that happen. I mean, they're really fun microaggressions for me. Hey, they're really fun microaggressions because I was actually swimming in Provincetown, this wide swath and swimming, and there was some white person, man, 
you know, swimming and said to me, you know, something like, you're in the way, this is, ocean is too small. I, I don't even know what he said, but it was like, he would not move. And we're both swimming along the shore. I'm swimming, what? he's, he's. I know. And he was like, you know, can't you see anyone else? And I just stopped and I just read him so hard and I had the camera going. And so I have video of him, but I realized I want to write down the phrase. I don't know it now because I let go of it because otherwise it's a toxic thing. But I began to take that phrase and put it back into the water and wash it and sit with it, give it back to the ocean. And see, that's careful attention. Yeah, I was I mean, there every and day. It's also following not only the fields of study that you're told, okay, these are the valuable fields, fields, these are the things to attend to, that you're able to say, huh, this leads my, this piques my interest, and so I'm going to see what happens when I walk over here with it. Exactly. And that's the undisciplining part that I often think, and I, I'm, there, that's because there are people I recognize in the room, so I'm kind of looking at them. And I think of the fear of getting it wrong as opposed to the capacity to follow your stream of interest into the unknown space that may allow you to get to something you had no idea you could get to through the work. And so the practice is one thing. I mean, there's that what, the Pushkin quote, um, inspiration will not be sought, it must itself find the poet. And so in the meantime, the poet practices, does different things, tries different things, and comes to something else. Mm -hmm. And that's the improvisatory capacity that you show in the film, that you show in your work. Um, and that becomes about, I love that quote, the improvisatory is not an accident. No, it's a lot. I mean, you know, those are also the deceptive thing is, you know, working in visual art and performance, I am so out of time. So if I'm working on, on, a, on the set, right, of my imaginary world of making, I mean, I will, I will be out in that field on the beach for 12 hours. And to the point where I'll start sketching, I'll make video, I'll move again. Uh, someone might try to talk to me. It'll be night, it'll get dark, I'll come back. I, but just, I'm committed to all of the things that could be, in a way, healthy, but also kind of, I have to watch it, right? Because I'm swimming and I'm filming, I'm trying to move cameras around, I'm trying to write, I'm drawing. But I'm committed to saying, you know, and I mean, also, here's the thing. There are people I think through. William Kentridge, I'm very interested in William Kentridge's process as a, as a wanderer, he, as a kind of someone who moves and paces in the studio. I'm also inspired by um, Adrian Piper's mm -hmm. um, um, practice of a long-term practice, but particularly sort of the conceptual art practices of, of the 70s, of moving through cities of mantras. I'm, I'm interested in... Um, the commitments to um, Guillermo Gomez Pena's work. I mean, I studied their work really close. I think about it all the time. And I work, and I realize I think the, one of the reasons why I have um, a, a legible art practice is because I look really closely at all of Kara Walker's work, all of it. I mean, deeply sat in, in museums as a graduate student. I remember it was like the Greater New York show. I'm like, I'm just going to lay down in the middle and just like, you know, get these things, get get this work, get and just figure out what's happening. I had this really nice shirt on. I was like, I'm ruining this shirt. But I, I you know, it was it was too you weren't supposed to sweat in it. Nobody told like, you to move? I no. But you know, <laughs> exactly, right? This is right. the thing around no, but I come armed, you know, to the teeth in 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 these situations with enough enough to send out the warning signs, right? A Bruno Mogli loafer, <laughs> you know, a a, a, a two thousand dollar camera, <laughs> you know, um, you know, a vintage Barney's jacket. People know. They so you know. You have to have props. 
Well, it's also like ven- it's like a you know it's like a venomous spider, right? <laughs> if you're gonna bite into that, you're not even gonna try to beat that down because you know it's the warning signs are are are, are they're, they're tell they're not violent. They're sh- they're enough to say, oh, you're gonna a, a tripod in space. I'm telling you, I've gotten to so many places. Tripod, camera. Oh, are you working? What do you? Do? No problem. And and I, and I think that that's a part of play. At my, my performance practice is also playing around with swimming, even even stroke technique. If I'm swimming on the beach and doing IMs, which butter back free straight up butterfly. Who's please? Do you actually think someone's going to be like, oh, stop swimming? I'm like, oh yeah, okay. Excuse me. <laughs> It's so intimidating. It's intimidating. If you see me at the tennis court, I'm hitting inside out serves on the tee that are kicking out wide. I mean, I know how to do that because my father and mother taught me that. That's the home training. That home training is like, oh, he's not just practicing a serve. He's ripping down the tee and that ball is doing the weirdest thing because I know about torque. Mm -hmm. I know about those things. My parents were teaching me that and that is the... I get so excited about it because it's like you don't really have to do any work, but you have to do the work. But you do, that's a you lot know what I mean? of energy. That is work. It's yeah. a lot of energy, but it's not, it's, 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 um, it's self-care mm-hmm. in a way. It's also interesting that the home training, when I think of navigating the professional space, that there become these ways that the multiple kinds of training are necessary to survive in multiple spaces. Yeah, let's talk about that. Uh, let's keep talking about what it means to survive in these spaces and to borrow Nerbeze's, keep thinking about Nerbeze Philip, keep thinking about thriving, mm-hmm. you know, and, and enduring and endurance and enduring freedom. I mean, there is something very particular about the endurance project, the kind of time-based work um, as someone who's concerned with questions of spectacle, being seen, to bring multiple cameras when you know. Because when it gets popped off, I, I'm recording, but it's so interesting, the people that interrupt when you, I'm doing performance pieces. It's actually outrageously, it's fascinating. Well, I think about the guy on the beach, and I think about Du Bois, yes. that there's a way in which we are always, certain of us are always imagined as a spectacle. Mm-hmm. And so there's the recognition of that, which then means, <laughs> I don't know, you can have the certain shoes, the shirt and bag, those things. Yeah. And you're like, okay, I'm being seen. This is how you're going to see me. And that's a survival strategy. It is too. And it's, it's also the conversation between, you know, I'm thinking about this guy going down the beach with his glasses on, you know, and the little hat, you know, sashaying through the water, old white man moving through the water. Total draw. Like he wants to be the center. He wants that. He wants to be the star. But that's not going to happen when all the Wilsons in town. No, your your whole run, your whole world is like you're just going to be erased. You are just a a dot in the middle of the field at that point. You're rendered into into your whole world of And I remember him saying, "I wasn't going to move." And I remember saying, wow, you know, you really, you, you're so obnoxious. And I remember having this deep conversation with him, like, that is so horrible. Why do you think you can say that? And I was like, whatever, as I filmed him moving into the distance and him noticing that I was filming too. Mm-hmm. But I think that kind of challenge of how do we understand who, what the tension is, right? The tension is not simply, and you know this, right? The tension is not simply you need to die, it's like, you know, I have such a will to live that you can't exist. You know? Not as you are. No, I mean, and, and, and it's, not that, it's not that hard to have that stance when you have every, you have the entire ocean, he thought, backing him. Right. The entire beach was his war. I was like, we're in the ocean. Right, there's enough room. Yeah, mm-hmm. but in his mind, this is that was like, wow, that is really crazy. I was like, you know, but it's it's funny. It's a construction of of not only self but a construction of the world. And I do want you to read more work. Um, yeah. But I think of telling someone 
telling someone I was dating that uh, I'm willing to play a bit part in your movie, but I have my own movie I star in. Mm. And it was almost like mm. he was shocked. Mm. And I thought, wow, it's so weird. Like people think that you're just a bit player in their movies. And so what if we actually move through the world as if, oh, you're a star too? Great. Right. Nice to see you. How's your movie going? My movie's going great. As opposed to the demand that, in fact, people behave in ways that suit the movie we're narrating. Yeah. I mean, the phrase that comes to mind is, those are loving words, right? I mean, that's an invitation to like okay fine let's we're okay you know we're it's on now mm -hmm. right because it comes from an ethos of love and yes. i and i think there is maybe something really clear about the other side which may be hate right it might be ignorance it might be a number of things it may be terror it may be terrorism it may be all of the things on the other side of love I think, but the effort that you're making to maintain a, a relationship that's compartmentalized but also organized is, is, comes from a position of wanting to share. It does, but I don't think that people necessarily understand that. Like, I, I think it's possible to hold multiple things, right? Mm -hmm. That on the one hand, there's the compartmentalization of, well, here's my movie, but there's also my attitude that I'm creamed corn. I'm not whole kernel corn, mm -hmm. so I'm not going to stay in one little section of the plate. <laughs> and so how do we make space for that? I mean, that's the dynam part of the dynamism of the work. There's also incredible, there's difficult beauty in much of your work. Um, shall we bring yeah, some I, 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 I will. I'm thinking about the cream corn mm -hmm. and the kind of... Um, Maybe we'll sort of think of that as a, as a, as a kind of, I want to say limit, but also as an invitation, as a texture, as a food, as a, as a warm spot, as a, a something. Lucy Smug, if I were you sitting there next to the white wall, a black grate latched into the side of the house, I wouldn't say a thing. In the forest, a shining tree breaks against the leaves where metaphor fails. It must be horrid to be a black, tender or solid, fluid-filled or packed. I follow my instinct to the rocks in the middle of a river which winds wildly across what I hate, my constant having to ask the spelling of your name. Near the edge of the mouth of another dumb subject is not the weight of silence, is not being quiet, when I need to, it's that I'm winded. Fire ignites, flooding the heat of my face until it explodes. I twist in the room, bake and peel. I break a gray block hard against a wall. I hate them. I hate him. To think to be cornered is like being swallowed whole. In the end, I hate you too. In the heat, I'm not burning, but find myself climbing. If I were not me, would I respond as variously to the ropes of hair wet and matte on the tile? Would I listen to the sound of the trees shaking on the mountain? What if I were as round and useless as a load of fleshy brown fat? What if I too were so slow, so pulled back by the shore, so equal to the freight of feeling, wound to indecision, two spiders dead under a white table, one a daddy long legs. One has killed another, leaving its hull under the furniture sucked dry. Another dead gripped in the shape of a thin lantern, a teeny, tiny jellyfish. So that's a I think a, a way of, of what I love about this conversation and the actual um, thinking and the study of, 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 I think, the set of questions that might move under a theory of a kind of 
porous, mushy, cream corn blackness <laughs> as a site of ideation, of identity making, is that under this sort of saturated zone of the plate that needs and moves, I think there are questions, right? There are, there are real long, the uh, long, long durée of philo philosophical questions that really ask us to think about subjectivity and subjectivity's relationship to how do we find our footing when, you know, we can't even, we want, we need and can't chew, but we need and understand cream as both pleasure and also difficulty rendering point. But, and then my larger question is, how do we think about this in terms of playing the role of the other who's speaking back, right? Because this book, Lucy 72, was like my moment to say, you know what? I need to really deal with this white women thing. This is the sort of like the moment of the inside of what it meant to like, I need to go in there and just be that for these poems and really deal with what it means to write from this vector of whiteness, white womanhood. And I also thought, well, I want to be this white woman, but I'm also like this, per this figure is also a rock. And this person is also, and it's also inspired by Cornelia Seedy's um, Brutal Imagination. I remember when I, uh, just the sort of idea of just changing out the space between what's the white body in the black body or realization of cream corn? And what is that color? You know, what is that color of, does it shift, does it change, does it leap? And is, are those the terms in which we must, I will say this, right, because I am interested in declaratives as a full professor. What are the ways in which we must maintain a relationship between the kind of strangulation of that substance to make some kind of ethic? You know, it might be love, but I, I think I always return to it. Well, for a while, um, I did this, this talk about um, something I call uncommodified love. And I'm still trying to define the, the parameters of that term. But I think often of all the ways, of all the ways we're asked to make of ourselves a brand, a thing, um, to sort of mark ourselves such that we're easily identifiable, right? And that we want others to be identifiable. Otherwise, they're necessarily a threat. So, I mean, th this is old, but Edward Glissant's argument that everyone has the right to opacity. Well, what does that mean as an ethical practice? Right? It means that sometimes that creamed corn is illegible. And we do not consume it. It's there and there, and we exist alongside it. And it's not about toleration, because we actually have, each of us and us together, have levels and aspects of the self or of selves that are opaque, that are not transparent and not to be seen, and maybe that's okay. In fact, maybe it's necessary. It's, it, you know, I, I think, mm, what is it, you didn't say unconditional. I said uncommodified love. Uncommodified, right. And that's a hard thing. Like, we were talking about the awards we won a, as identifying, and in some ways, that's a thingification of us. And yet, those awards, like, I don't have a trust. Those awards make it possible for me to have time to write. It makes it possible for me to have time to think. It makes it possible for me to be in community and in conversation and to live a life 
not only of the mind, because I often think that the notion of the life of the mind is not actually about considering the actions that can be taken and undertaking action that allows us to exist differently together. That's what I'm in it for. Like, I think there are ways that writing gives us some insight. Uh, oh, no. Insight is the wrong, is, is not quite accurate. But maybe it's a, a, a space in which to practice, in which to play at how to be. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, I, I, what I love in, in terms of the way that you're talking about are just really the clarity of your commitment to a sort of uncompromising relationship to, you know, what it takes to operate in the space of illegibility. You know, something came up in my poetry class today, which was a curious, I won't say because it's, it's a private workshop, but I will give you the sort of parameters of the discussion. It had to do with this question of translation and folks working in languages. I wouldn't even say the language because that might be too, but let's just say what, what I was most struck with was the urgency of, of the self, legibility, nation, and risk, accuracy, all of these things. And I was thinking, you know, we're making art. All the mishearings and all the arguments are part of life. The illegibility is also the place between knowing and not knowing, which is part of learning a language or not learning a language and to resist. But this notion of mastery has a lot of repercussions. And I love Kerry James's Marshall's mastery apostrophe with mastery, you know, that kind of he respells it. And the, the apostrophe is this moment which makes you think about, you know, what are we attempting to learn and convey, if not the this sort of map that says, I mean, I'm really, I love this ending of your, your bio. The sen I, I guess I can say it because it's your bio, but I love she is a new resident in a decades old Emeryville Artist Cooperative. I thought, what a fantastic way to end a bio. I also make a great citrus honey drink and a fantastic gumbo and red beans and rice. And I'm very, and I have three miraculous sisters. So. I love that because I think those are all awards or rewards or moving into the space of opening up what's possible in the ways that we are legible in, in other ways that move us just slightly outside of the contract but still allow us to, you know, remain. I always think about camouflage. I think about, you know, working in um, that, that, the piece of writing or the piece of thinking or the, the visual art is always a kind of dynamic space for both interrogation and inquiry, mm -hmm. right? Like sort of the moving through the line and the moving through the sentence is, I think it's, it's necessitated maybe, what we're maybe both talking about is the living being and also the need to recognize, to make something as concrete as a book that somehow represents the, the static object, but it, it's doing a kind of that dance. Mm -hmm. and, and those commitments are, what are they? They are unrecognizable by certain award streams, I'd say intentionally for me. Mm -hmm. You know, I don't, I don't, I would, I don't know, think I would die. That's being exaggerating, right? I would be very upset if someone said, hey, Ronaldo, please, Come, come to my uni uh, no, 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 um, no, no shade on someone who is working in poetry, but for me is dissatisfying to go on a trip and say, hey, Ronaldo, will you come as a poet and talk about your poetry? Now I'm super excited about it, it as I say it. But I, I never wanted that. I never wanted to be recognized as that figure or, oh, would you come as a scholar? And I'm like, mm. but now I'm interested in it because I have a number of, of works that move enough to be slippery. But as I was writing as a younger person, I just never wanted that. I will always say the wrong thing intentionally or do the worst thing at a reading. Or, but it always turned out in some ways to get to that mm -hmm. space of the kind of domestic um, rendering field work. Mm -hmm. I really want to 
just sit with um, this notion of your mother grieving by farming, right? Mm. To turn her grief into something to grow. Um, there's a line I have in a piece that says, grief grown rooted and wild, grief like dirt. And that I think there is something about digging into the ground that is also about and hmm, that's about becoming acquainted with the soul. Mm -hmm. Because we know the body is how we know the soul. And so what is it to be in that fleshy experience to imagine, to wait to experience what may possibly be beyond it. And there's just, I mean, that image of her saying, okay, we are going to make something of this soil. It's a, it's a powerful refrain in terms of also, and a practical one too, because, you know, my mother had fallen when I was at McDowell, actually. It was just like, Wow, my dad dies, I go to McDowell, and then, you know, I'm working at this retreat, and suddenly, oh, mom's fallen, and, you know, and she, I won't say, but she was like, okay, there's this mess, right, blood, all this stuff. But also, she falls all the time in her garden. It's all soft. She's <laughs> like, oh, I'm falling, here I go. I'm it's like making, you know, mm -hmm. and to be aware. And I would say, too, that my mother, in, some, in many ways, my father, uh, my mother in particular was a, 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 is an artist. You know, in many ways, and building and making, but also her relationship to life mm -hmm. is so tied to this making. I'm always reminded of 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 threshold. There's always one more mm -hmm. kind of layer. Um, mm -hmm. And again, you know, as this is what I think about with my students, and you know, in the teaching of poetry, is like in, in creative writing or art making. It's like, what is your relationship to? you know, to your family who's touched you first. Like, that's really what ultimately, maybe, okay, so I think about it like, what if I was taught that as a student in writing, but then newsflash, oh, most of my professors who are folks of color, queer, black, died. Like way before, you know, I didn't get those kind of lessons. And I'm realizing, I, I know they would have probably said, in some ways, maybe they said that and I wasn't listening because I was a precocious, you know, rising poet and I wanted these things, but I wanted this kind of life. But I'm wondering around, like, so I feel like I talk to my students all the time. Like, I, I tell them, you know, I don't know if I'm going to come back. Like, we have this moment to learn this thing. I don't, I don't know if... You know, I get on planes, you move around. Like, you may not, I may not return. But I can say that we're here in this moment and we're learning this thing about mortality, about poetry making. And then we have this thing that we're sharing. And I always say, let's look at the date and, and, and time and let's mark that we've thought about this particular question, right? Or this feeling. And I think that that is something that I'm so thankful mm -hmm. to have you because in a way, you know, one thing that is the obvious is that Tanya and I are part of the first generation of kind of post-civil rights. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, if you think tightly around that term, but like, for instance, one concrete way is like my father actually had to go to water fountains that were, you know, whites only. And he's, like, he's actually mad. He's like, ah, those, those signs... Those signs, when I saw those Sambo signs, that made me so mad. And I was like, ah, ha, 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 silly dad. But he actually, it really made him mad. But for me, I was like, oh, it's optional to be angry. I'm going to, you know, it, it wasn't like a thing, right? But I think about what it means to just that little step that's, and how much wisdom that I think either consciously or unconsciously, it, it the, the sort of, you know, I don't know. I, I'm just thinking out loud, right? I don't think of myself as an old person, right. but I do wonder about what it means to kind of care for other people as, a, as an artist and, and, and to care for one another, but to also think about what are the things that we're going to, what are the sensibilities that we're going to pass along, which is a, an adjacency to 
what is, um, maybe this is the question you're asking around, what is your concern with the field mm -hmm. as opposed to what is your concern to the, what is your commitments to the theoretical intervention which leads to a body of scholarship? When actually, I associate bodies of scholarship with a phalanx of teachers mm -hmm. just died way too early. 56, I'm always shocked. Barbara Christian, 57. You know what I mean? Like, I'm like, whoa! Or just, just that reminder of, 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 of who's coming in and who's coming out, and then, and then to just stop for a little while and say, okay, we have one another, but we also have the potential to say, hey, wait a minute, I don't ever remember June Gordon was my teacher. And I remember when, when I met her you know, for this poetry for the people, we were, I said, June, how are you doing? She's like, Ronaldo, I haven't slept for three days. And I remember thinking, okay, there are times I sleep very little, but I know that I get a few hours of sleep. And I also don't know what it means to not have sleep and to be in that particular department at that time. And all the stress. Yeah. And animosity. Word. Towards her. Exactly. And to think of what that toxicity does to her. Mm -hmm. I mean, I asked the question about field and discipline because I think that one is required to. Um, maybe it's part of my question of who are you talking with? That that's always my question for myself. And that I cannot imagine that only people within the, the sort of parameters of the institution are the people I'm in conversation with. And those are not the only scholars I'm in conversation with. I'm in conversation with the intellectuals who may not have the degrees. But they have news of, you know, not just how to survive, but how to live um, in spaces where I'm not meant to survive. Because even as a child of, you know, the post civil, first generation sort of post civil rights, I, <laughs> one isn't always welcome. And so the idea of building, or I haven't always felt welcomed, and yet how I, the ways that I survived, it, it's weird, 11 years ago, this time of year, uh, this month, I was in a coma in a hospital um, near death. Mm -hmm. And I remember, well, I, Actually, I remember the coma dreams, oddly. But uh, one of the things I remember is the kind of, there was, of course, the family support. But then there was all this sort of community support where people were like, oh, we're not going to lose you. Mm -hmm. um, and so I cannot think anymore even though I have that inclination at times, I can no longer think that I am in this by myself. And so that means that I am only in the company of others. And so who you're talking with, who you have on speed dial, who you have, who you say hello to when you're walking down the street in the morning, that's who you keep it, that's who I'm keeping company with mm -hmm. and who it is I'm writing with those figures in the room. Mm -hmm. And not that I necessarily imagine they're ever gonna read my work, mm -hmm. but I'm saying if you're listening, if you're oh, I'm I'm talking to you. And I'm here with you. And that that when I think about the field and I think of undisciplining the field, I think it's kind of like, remember Marianne Cause. I love mm -hmm. Marianne Cause. My first class I took uh, was with her, first class in the PhD program. We're sitting around a table. I, 
she asked, why are you taking this class? <laughs> and a couple of the younger than me people said things like, oh, I love Victor Stone's work. And da, 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 da. And mm -hmm. I, I had to not burst out laughing mm -hmm. because I thought, this is the language you use to access power. Mm -hmm. This is not really a language of love or interest or, I don't know, inquiry. This is a language of like flexing. Mm -hmm. And so I'm sitting there and I'm thinking, well, wow, I just want to look at art and write about art and write my, you know, do my little simple thing. And so what is it to undiscipline the field such that, not that we don't study, mm -hmm. but so that we say, we are not limited to the parameters of this language mm -hmm. of whatever it is, whatever the field demands. Mm -hmm. And th that's sort of what I'm thinking about. And I'm thinking of who's inside and outside and how one moves through those porous boundaries or make them porous. Yeah, I mean, there's a, I'm wondering if you could read something for me. Okay, I would love to hear some work from the section in some Miliqui. Okay. Because I think that it might, I would love to hear them after you talk do that because I'm just curious how I hear the work now in relationship to the, 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 the kind of stakes of language. In soliloquies, earthworms aren't maggots. Eating them ain't planting a tree or a flag. She wants to shout at her TV when some Sue gulps earthworms from a cup. She wants to shout at this idea that there's play payback for what's done to come. Earthworms aren't decomposers nor distraction from street corner noise. You'd think a woman would know this, she thinks. This thought, a squirrel on a lawn. You'd think a woman, there are thoughts of other women, more squirrels, her mother. I'd hate you to miss sex when she wanted to be a nun. Her mother, I'd like to hear this. What do you know about a man? When she wrote home about her lover whose mother taught her to knit. When she wrote home about knitting, she was still girl incognizant. Still the girl writing, we are the faces we wear. Where? In flashback. Still the girl with a face like a movie screen who knits skull caps with yarn, red as cartoon blood, as red as mammy two shoes, shoes, mastic heads, yarn, red as cartoon lips and tongues, red as bandanas and pomegranates, red as blood butterflied across the seat and white of summer kulaks. Red is blood that says woman, maybe mother, says watch and count. Red as velvety cakes she thawed and ate over two months, morning times. Red as velveteen curtains she wanted to drape around this moment. Red as morning, as bluster, as bluff, as the flat of offering plates. Red as morning, as unheeded signal to stop, as sliced rare meat. Red as cherry now and laters, as pickled pig's lips, as bruised knuckles. Red as cherry blow pops, as big red gum, as loitering before sleep. Red as distant red hook bees, drunk on cherry fungicide cocktails. Red as distant space mapped, bought, and belonging on brutish say-so. 
Red is the administration of districts and blocked off blocks. Red is the administration of want as the redheaded wave so long. Red is red squirrels as maples as districts set for and lit with wanting. Red is red squirrels, North American, Eurasian, native migrant. Red as red as red. Ass red as a baboon's ass is red. Come on, stop. Red as red ass red, as the seeping of coulda, woulda, yuna. Yeah, thank you for reading that. And I think, or for one could say, seeing that through and rendering that in, in the space of, of the kind of bend of the kitchen sign. Mm -hmm. The sort of like hardness of it. I keep thinking about what it means to have this one term is the kind of polyvalence of it, mm -hmm. the sort of multiple approaches, but just the acceptance not of 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 abstraction, but literally of a kind of fragmented sensibility that understands all the eyes and the ears and the and this the ins and outs and voices, the possible amorphousness of, of earthworm audience, all of that's happening simultaneously as you're in the room. By that I mean you're not turning off your poet ears in these rooms, right? You're not turning off, it's like you, can't, you have no choice but, mm -hmm. to, but to hear and also applaud. And I'm really interested in that as it, what I learned today mm -hmm. is the insistence the reminder in, of your work and the kinds of ways in which you're moving through these questions to always have what, either the consequences, the benefits, the realities of leaving it on. Of leaving the sensibility on or the poet's ear or uh, something. I think something that's moving in terms of, of I keep thinking of this, these moments that are happening at the same time, both in the poems, but also in the study mm -hmm. and in the field of, the resistance is not, okay, I'm not going to hear this particular you know, rhetorical, tr no, I'm not I gonna fall Wittgen into that rhetorical I trap. Witch. I dig Wittgenstein. Like, I'm right. like, okay, he's got some interesting things to say. <laughs> but I'm also interested in Wittgenstein being in the room with, yeah. you know, um, Marvin Gaye. Right being in the room with, yep. that there's the whole, there are many possible worlds that seem to me legitimate mm. for exploration, examination, for attention. And it's that kind of, I don't know, I get excited and, and hyped up about it. I think that I am, each of us is multiple. And that it's that discomfort with our multiplicity that is actually about making us smaller and harder and um, more protected and protective and hostile. But it's the expansiveness of being that I'm interested in exploring. And that I, that I think your work explores, that I think your mind explores, how you exist, how you move through a room, all those things. I think Steve is signaling us, no, we're okay. Okay. Uh, I wanted to just say how important it is to just kind of put the, put the sort of um, the, the, the compositional frame around the brilliance of the undisciplined and the recreation as a site. That to me mm. is, the, is the way I would say, hmm, I haven't slept for a long time, but I was on a panel with Tanya and we thought about <laughs> recreation. So maybe I can rest a different way. And, or I was with you in this room and I can sleep maybe, the quality of sleep might be, it's like what, what's the sort of interlocutor that moves in so I wanted to thank you for putting together this and for inviting you know, UC Santa Cruz and our Living Writers conversation and this, to go back to Lord, right? This idea of how, how is difference forging power? That's and the question that this body of work makes all the time. Mm -hmm. 
and that we're walking together. Mm -hmm. That key to me is the mm -hmm. question of camaraderie and who's your crew, mm -hmm. you know? Mm -hmm. And it's with your crew that we make something else possible. Mm -hmm. Who's your crew? Who's your crew? And in that <laughs> crew it is where we make something possible. I'm just, in my mind, I'm just like thinking of all the possible, like, you know, song permutations. It's about to, it's about to jump off. <laughs> like, okay. Um, yeah, so I, I think it's great. I don't know where we are in terms of the next movements for like the, should we? Well, I'm hoping that we'll do our spring. We have a vision oh, that's right. for what we'll do in the spring. And we're, we yes. can't say anything until we make it happen, um, but yeah, some really remarkable poets. Do you guys have any questions? Uh, we kind of talk, but this is how we talk on the phone. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. It's true. <laughs> so, <laughs> it's true. <laughs> it's our phone it's conversation. True. Are there people, in, like I can't see, are, is there anyone in the Zoom? In the, we're not in the Zoom, we're on YouTube. Okay. They can't ask questions. They can make noises. They can make noises. <laughs> With words. They can dance. Yes. I'm sorry? They can make comments. They are commenting. There's over 100 people there. Yeah. Well, shoot. I was telling my class about that guy <coughs> who was at Berkeley and there was some strange guy in a seersucker suit at the hotel who talked to you. I don't remember oh his name. I, sorry, this is our phone call. Forget it. <laughs> Do you have questions? <laughs> Any questions out there? Anyone? Oh, I guess not. Oh, she is. Um, she has like another phone in her name. Oh, um, broccoli. Um, and that's her latest. Thing, broccoli and yeah. sweet potatoes. She's discovering all these different, you know, elements. Those are really good for you. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I think she just sent me a long message. I thought she was talking to me. She said, um, "How can I be baptized?" Yeah, it's a lot. These are really good questions. No, I you mean, should repeat them. yeah, they they are. Oh, the question is, so you, you mentioned. Um, uh, remind me your name. Nona. Nona mentioned first the relationship with my my mother's relationship to the garden, and or to farming, and also talked about the relationship between her husband, which I guess I talked about, and then the third question is like, what was the lawn before? Yeah, you know, my niece came and lived with us, with them, and so she was already doing some elements of gardening. But my mother, you know, w was always at the edges, always planting. But there was just like the regular grass, you know? So it was kind of messed up because no watering in California, right? Well, that's what I thought. That's what I thought. Yeah, but it's a good question because she was interested in the clay. Yeah. Like, like, oh, I, can't, I have to get through this clay. Mm. You know, how do I get through, how do I break this soil, you know? But it's it's a it's a complicated. St I keep returning to it in everything I'm doing right now. Every in fact, the paintings I'm making, I have phone conversations with my mother and just record her. And it goes back to this question of, okay, here's the real answer to the question. Its material has to do with a kind of it's illegible. 
And thank you, Nona, for reminding me that it has always been an illegible lawn. You know, and that illegibility is a way of saying, you know, it need not be perfect, it need not be, but it certainly always is has a certain kind of richness. But I think to be the author of the text, in the obviously, you know, my mother's eighty, her her husband just died, right? So the 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 lifespan, we know what's coming, right? I get it now, but but the decision to be the the author of this story at that moment, and to be the site of the, the kind of titillation of, of a possible legible story, which is actually communal, mm -hmm. is, right. is, is what it's about, I think, in you know, modeling whatever it needs to be. And that is so interesting. And I, I'd venture forth to think that this is a common story for many of us, for all of us who have kinship or family structures. And I think, you know, I want to share that as a form, mm -hmm. but a form that is as valuable as, you know, that moment in which I was thinking about what are the, I'm thinking of like, you know, James Baldwin and, and Willis Inca and just like traveling and this conference and like, what are they building? Like, what, why are they making, what, what a conversation are they? It is so similar to my mother's communication with her grandchildren with me. It is so similar, this need for community, but just the destabilize family structures and friendship structures. And then we get to, gosh, you're teaching at this great university. I'm teaching a great university. We worked hard and we made something out of this. Like, we're good, right? We're good people. And suddenly we're like, okay, I just want to share this thing, mm -hmm. right? And it captures the picture in your mind. And I think of um, that commitment to life Right? Mm -hmm. It's an assertion of living and power mm -hmm. in this way where there are a lot of people who would draw exactly after catastrophe. Exactly. And say, oh, you know, I'm done. Your mother said, not only am I going to plant a farm, but I'm going to draw you all into it with me. This is the lesson of fiction, right? <laughs> Th this is the this is the lesson where you understand that someone who, you know, someone who leaves their entire family. There's this moment where my mother in recording, she goes, My my family, you know, they said if you marry that man, your 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 kids, they're going to look like they're you know he's a black pig and your kids are going to look like black pigs. And then my mom said, but you know, I was just, you know, I was just really curious. I wanted to see what would happen. I mean, I had love for him, but I just wanted to see what happened if I did this thing and married. And I was like, whoa, risk and reward, mama. She's like, oh, I just wanted to see. And I was like, I'm getting this, I'm recording this. And then I'm like, okay, okay. And then I start drawing. That's why the, draw the lines are so crazy. Because it's like this woman had this, you know, curiosity about, you know, those things. I just wanted to what see, we did. What right? Possible? You know, they that because it was an intensity of feeling that maybe it's like okay, to go back to what's repressed, right? Like, mm -hmm. if you hate it that much, it must be something must be good <laughs> that you're keeping from me. Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's funny. It's complicated. Yeah. Yeah. Oh. No, a question from the audience out in the world of the uh, live stream. And um, a question with a, a relevant comment. Um, somebody else just spoke and bumped them. Um, I'd love to hear how you all think about undisciplining as an act of care. That's Will Clark and, and Roxy Power says, um, undisciplining as an act of care hails others into the field, making them legible. There's a poetic history of talking about opening the field, but usually to more objects, not more people. You know, so so a, a complex of question, comment, etc. But 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 undisciplining, undisciplining as an act of care. I guess that's the basic question. Well, uh, hmm. I was a graduate student when. Uh, And, um, and I, of course, had done something 
that I'm terrible with paperwork. And so I had not turned in my insurance form. Mm. So not only did I get deathly ill, I didn't have insurance. And the doctor who first saw me said, oh, I think you need a blood transfusion. Then he sent me home. Um, and so I went home, <laughs> and I was probably delirious and whatever. And so I was talking to one of my best friends. And I'm talking to her about, I was obsessed at that time with Charles Burnett's Killer of Sheep. And so I, my friend was working on an essay. And he's like, well, you know, <laughs> I'm laughing because this is ridiculous. I'm sort of, I said, yeah, he said I need a blood transfusion, but I'm going to turn in my form in the next few days, and then I'll go see about the blood transfusion. And she's like, okay, I'm finishing this essay. And she was thinking about Ralph Cramden hmm. from The Honeymooners. And I said, well, Ralph Cramden's melancholia is not quite melancholia, and it's really different from the character in Charles Burnett's Killer of Sheep, because he has no opportunity for leisure. And I do this breakdown of mm. comparison. And mm. what does it mean to be a uh, poor black man with nowhere to go? <laughs> and so I do this, and then I'm like, OK, now I I'm going to try to sleep. And I'm in pain, and I can't quite sleep, and I can't quit, get quite easy. So my friend calls my neighbor, that who's also my friend, who's in graduate school with me. And she's like, what is Tanya talking about? What's going on? And then she calls someone from the Center for Humanities, where I'm working. She's like, Anna Bozicevic, what happened? What the doctor said? And the doctor said, and Anna said, I don't know. So my friend says, get Tanya to the hospital. Just somebody take her. I'll come. So they take me to the hospital. Um, stuff hits the fan in this house. Well, what I know is that I got through this in part because of family that wasn't connected to this, because of people at the institution, because of people I knew around the institution, and that there was this incredible moment where, at least for me, I came to understand that I lived in a complicated community with um, people I knew in radically different ways. And that whatever my work was, it was work in conversation with people in all these different spaces. That's a weird and winding story. No, it's but not. that's how I think of undisciplining. That I actually think those varied communities kept me alive. Um, and that it's only because I understood that. I, you know, it's it's also the thing of when I was a kid. Um, it was people who were not at my school, who were like, okay, this little knucklehead is gonna go abroad. Let's raise some money and send her over. And so it's those communities that I think of. I think about care and discipline as that. I don't think there's anything I can think that is outside the realm of possibility for people who are not institutionalized to appreciate and access. Long winding story. No, it's not. I mean, I think it's not. I think it's important because. I always think of, of 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 the silences to go back to Ro Roxy's question and your answer, which I think is both vivid 
and so beautiful because it makes palpable both both the kinds of the invisible relationships that make possible our ascent, right? The the financial decisions people make, the care. I mean, it's like I was thinking. I was thinking about the these, again, like you know, as the same adage of race as a social construct. Of you have to work, whatever, how many times harder, right? As a POC for a black person in the academy, right? But actually, you're making me realize, like, there's a lot of other people who have Work been working hard. multiply. <laughs> it's not just your body. It's this phalanx of people who brought you to this place. Little gestures, like my uncle's, you know, pulling, material, pulling money together so I didn't have to get to pay tuition at Berkeley for uh, my, my little dorm room. And me and my little attitude coming home, grandma's wearing my robe. And all my uncles coming home saying, what, you have a robe? Your grandma wearing your robe? And I was like, okay, okay, I get it. And then I was on the couch. I had no room, right? But part of it was like this, that conversation making it really visible for people who don't, I mean, is that the kind of trust fund, right? Is, is you know what I'm saying? Like that's a kind of irrepressible, priceless, value that you're making me understand. I don't think it's long and winding because I think those sort of tentacular and beautiful moments that are just outside of the picture, they, you know, they are the brilliance just as much as, you know, obviously, right? We wouldn't be where we are if we didn't have a certain set of preparation skill and all of the things so hard, right? Mm -hmm. But at the same time, is there's all of this other kind of touching and labor that happens and friends. And, and that's what's lovely because I have known the value of our friendship and our social group, like, you know, uh, our contemporaries. It's palpable. Like, we're floating around at the same time. John Keane, Don Martin, Turquoise Dyson, you know, Mindy Tanya, Mindy. Mendy, Keith. Like, we're alive in this, and we know something's happening, right? We're not shy about it. We're like, okay, yeah, Durelli Harris, okay. Mm -hmm. It's it's popping. But to just know that it's not, that we're, what you're saying is so beautiful to me because it's also a matter of saying, what if we made that um, just like the cream corn? That That's part of the plate. That's part of the, the, the that's seepage. Right. Don't lie about it. Nobody makes it through this by themselves. Yeah. Nobody. Yeah. No matter what superstar life, whatever they're living, it's a lie that they are the singular star. And that crew is no joke. <laughs> the crew, the crew is also like choosing that particular group, friend group, and d being discerning enough to know, no, you need to come over here, <laughs> because the real thinking might, it might, but this is where it's really happening. I'm just saying that because it's like it's just nice to to just kind of come out in that way publicly in in a discussion that says these are the terms of engagement. That's right, and that it's not about the brand. It's actually about another, I don't, I don't even know what to call it, but another space of feeling and value that is not just about brand. I mean, it's, tru it's truly peopled, to go to the question, right? It's truly peopled before, right? Mm -hmm. A priori, a priori, a priori, a priori feeling peopled anyways. So you had a question, no? Uh, yeah, so, and you had said earlier, you said that you were from the first generation after the civil rights movement. And um, and then Dr. Foster was saying how, when she went to, went to graduate school and she was having this whole Du Bois thing about, about double, double huh. consciousness and how, um, you know, how come you can't have Marvin Gaye and, and all this kind of speech. And I was, thinking that the further that I go, the less and less people I see that are like me. Um, there are people that look like me. There was a, you know, there's a big influx of, of, of Africans that have came here and they, um, and so they look like us, but they're not us. They're not, you know, they're not descendants of slaves. And I was just, 
thinking, uh, you said it's the discomfort of our multiplicity that makes us small. Um, where we want to be many different things and also, and also I think that being biracial, being biracial, we also have to tap dance and it's a whole different thing. And my, I think my question is, now that you are the teachers in the beginning of an entire new civil rights movement, what what do you what do you want us to what do you want us to know from your experience so that we don't have to have this this staged speech this speech that makes them comfortable so that they do you see what I'm you're you know you're our teachers now right. what do we do It's funny for me. I I ask that question all the time because I can say that even in the classroom, issues around race and power come up all the time. And so the notion of who I am in front of the classroom plays out in classrooms where many of the students don't look like me or don't have similar experiences to me. What I try to do in a classroom space, because I am so not interested in mastery. Students assume that means I'm not interested in expertise. And I think there's something, there's a really nuanced difference between expertise and mastery. Expertise allows for careful study and inquiry. Mastery assumes a certain kind of control and assumes certainty. And I think that mastery has been deadly for many of us. So I try to make a classroom space in which student voices are primary, where they get to ask questions, and where the idea of um, the knowledge that you bring with you is something to tend to, even as you learn mm -hmm. these other things, right? If it's older white men that decide what fine art is then how how do we how, how do we go around that am i am i even making sense okay yeah think of the, the funny the thing that ju jumped into my head which isn't funny is the g's been quilters right so g's been quilters um south carolina um I could pull up some of the quilts, but the quilts are now sold in the Tate. They were in the Tate Modern. They were in MoMA. Mm -hmm. Le yes. So they've been sort of around the world, right? But these are quilts uh, black women were making for families, making and selling and making their artwork and the rest of the world caught up. Like, I, I honestly think, when you think about fine art, uh, I always knew I would write, but I always knew I'd have a job, right? And I never assumed that my art would be my job. I never thought that, right? So, I don't know if that, that answers your question. It's kind of like, remember that Robert Towns, no, you don't remember this, Robert Townsend movie in which he says there's always a job at the post office. No, it answers my question, but it breaks my heart because it's just, I mean, I'm the only, you know, I'm the only student in our class that's a double major because I know 
you that have to have a job. I have to have a, a no, no. Um, know that Aimé Césaire was a cabinet minister for Martinique. Aimé Césaire, one of the most brilliant poets of the Negritude movement, but of any time, right? So that, um, it, 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 no, because, um, no, because when he was naming, when he was naming pieces that you couldn't find at Walmart, when he's naming the expensive shoes and the expensive jacket, and none of that, none of that is from us. And it's not that we don't make and do beautiful things. It's that old white men decide what fine art is. I think that that is one way of understanding who, you know, I, rem I remember this moment where I wrote part of my dissertation practice was looking at Adrian Piper's work. He's a great conceptual artist. Do you know Adrian Piper's work? No, I don't know any visual so work at all. Adrian Sorry. Piper is a kind of a double major, right? Adrian Piper is a, a, an esteemed philosopher who wrote on Kant, Kant's pure critique of racism, and is, is a fully fledged Harvard philosopher, massive two volume work of, of philosophy, but also left the academy and two volume work of of art over you know it, it, as soon as you, your mind will be blown if you think about her because when i was working on a dissertation with michelle wallace at, at um at the cuny graduate center i said you know michelle it's like i gotta read it's like i have to get to the Kant, and she was like excuse me you don't think that adrian piper has processed the Kant for you <laughs> and i was like Oh, I guess I don't have to look at the old white man. I can just sit with this work. Two volumes. And has this, so I don't look, I mean, I don't even, why not relegate the white man to the footnote? Why, why, why? Why do, why do they have to, first of all, the choice of placing expensive or name brand products in a conceptual field is in conversation with black art. William Pope L, Adrian Piper, Kara Walker, Gwendolyn Brooks, June Jordan, um, you know, uh, Ida B. Wells. The the system of cataloging is 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 a is a gesture to the is to the um, to the kind of epistemological um, field that I'm interested in, and I'm indebted to black and brown people as the people that I study. Like if I teach a course, right? I'm teaching this course called Black Queer Theory as Practice, right? And what I love about the course is like, you know what? I want to read, you know, there are people that I could work, you know, maybe m queer theorists that I think through, but I'm like, you know what? I'm going to just look at some Baldwin, Audre Lorde, and June Jordan. They will be my legends. And they, they, they take up the space, and then we move from those folks to then, okay, then we might look at Tanya's work, or then we might look at maybe Sadia comes up, or, Sadia, or maybe Fred comes up, but that's okay if they do or don't. I'm really interested in how do we get, and as my training in looking at black art. One, one show, one place I would encourage you to go to if you haven't, it's in your city, is Faith, Ro Faith Ringgold's um, a, a, a retrospective, first ever in this illustrious career that I saw at the MoMA, not so MoMA, the Whitney, in which I rented a hotel for two weeks no, I think for that time it was it was just for, for four days, and I just spent the day looking at that work. So my feeling is like this question you you had of 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 you don't have you don't have to or you don't. There was a way in which you phrased it where you what what the question was. I, I guess my question is: Do you want to believe the reality that there are actual that they don't matter? That white male artists are like these these arbiters of they don't matter if you have, if you're looking at I I like to look at people who have hmm who's been working like William Kentridge right white South African artist dope massive career I saw his full term full retrospective in Berlin around the same time when I saw Adrian Piper's retrospective but I actually went to Berlin to check out her archives because she has a, um, an institute in Germany. No, it's a complicated story. It's really complicated because I wasn't ready to meet Adrian Piper. I mean, in order to meet Adrian Piper, I could because I have a certain way, but 
I wasn't ready to have the discussion because you have to have a, a different relationship to art and practice and I wasn't ready to have that. But I guess in some ways I've sat with the work enough to where I didn't really think I needed to meet Adrian Piper at that moment, but I'm just saying there are, this is the thing I learned in reading every single piece of work from Gwendolyn Brooks. All of the biographies, all of the poetry, all of the criticism. I didn't worry about, you know, Old man, whitey ball. It was, it was, it, it was it, there was no, there was, you know, there was like not, no, no comparison. There's no other genius. So like, if that's my genius, like, uh, and if you're working in the field, and, and this is one thing we, we learned at, at the CUNY Graduate Center. One of our training is like, the center point is your center point. And if you look at the people who've come from our institution, um, Simone White, um, Maggie Nelson, Greg Pardlow was moving around the area. It's just an institution where you don't, it's like they're interchangeable. But part of it is, are you actually going to believe that, there, it, that it is not the case that old white men have created the conditions for fine art? And check it out, check, have that question with, with Faith Ringgold. She's all about it with these white figures in these, in these quilts. It's outrageous. She creates a fictional character that actually travels and is in, she's repainting Picasso in these quilts, repainting all of the famous, and placing the narrative in there, and then writing a novella underneath it for children and protesting. And I'm like, there's no one else. There's no, and no one matters. It's like, okay, yeah, okay, okay, and I love Andy Warhol. But it's like, okay, now they're in conversation. I never, and also, and this is my other question is, who are the like dope ass white people, right? Like that's why I'm like William Kentridge, get it, you know? I, I think about another another person to think through is this is a a, a, a a new not a new Karma Mayette is a poet, also a performance artist. She has this beautiful, brilliant kind of play that she's working on, where she deals with where the she's reading race cards, and then the kind of um, contrapuntal moment is. She plays a, she's like, if the audience gets it right or wrong, she then plays a white soul song. And she's like, and she talks about, oh yeah, I was dancing to like, it might be like Joni Mitchell, and Joni Mitchell touched her. So part of it is like, you know, if I, I will tell you, you know, if it weren't for the Beatles, I don't think I would have understood what it meant to, to sing and to understand the capaciousness of audience. Because my parents were, I was like, Mom, Dad, have Beatlemania. And they're like, what's wrong with you? What's, but it was infectious. And it came from a different place than my needing to learn Kant. But I just think there's a lot of models out. I mean, especially now. I'm sorry, I, I don't know what Kant is. <laughs> oh, it's just, uh, it's just it's not important. That's a lot Enlightenment. Of dude. Yeah, this is someone that just, my answer is, just please check out that show. We're going, actually, my class is going to the I told them we're going We're, we're all to going together. Well, that's if people can go on the 18th. Oh, it's sure. at the De Young. Can we do another day? Can we do another day? We have to do another day. So Wednesday would probably be ideal. We're, gonna go we're on going to, Tuesday. no, I told both classes. We, we were trying to negotiate this. But Wednesday would probably be better for people. That's where I'm bringing my grad student and graduate student. And, and to go right. And we're just going to get popping and then just like sit at the altar of all things faith. But I do have to say, you probably should go more than once. It's a massive show. And when I went to see it, I walked and walked and sat. And it's stunning. And well, I saw it at the MoMA. Go more than one time. Not next week. No, no, no. It's at the De Young, and we're not going till November, sometime in November. Um, but I don't know why you're thinking next Wednesday. <laughs> um, but I would go more than once. Just because the course of study that, it's just such an important deal to understand that you know, to return, to, your practice might be something that you haven't discovered yet, like your research practice, right? Like, I just, I'm so struck by. And you don't have to kill off all white people. I mean, I. I, I don't know. 
You know what I'm, I can't, I can't get enough, as they say. <laughs> Sorry. Okay, you're not supposed to say that in public. <laughs> I, I'm an addict. <laughs> but. What can I say? I'm deeply, it's I'm so say, wrong. I'm saying this because your, um, what do you call it? Your influence, no, that your areas of influence or interest, if you follow them, and follow them with a kind of tenacity, and even with your crew with you. Fred said to me, well, I'm like, Fred, I think I'm going to leave Cuck, but I'm scared. And he said, don't go in there by yourself. Right. And so that thing that you take your crew with you, that this is not, um, when I talk about poetry, I mean, uh, Ronaldo, I talked to Abu, I talked to Marcel, I talked to a host of people that those are the people I'm thinking through what I'm making with. So there's that. It doesn't have to be a tragedy that you have to do a double major that one hopes the artist is writing and thinking about something other than just navel gazing, right? I mean, know something. I told everybody, I'm <laughs> reading Denise Farrar de Silva. Why? Because I'm like, okay, I, got, I have to understand this, and de Silva is reading Kindred. It's reading Octavia Butler. So it's not a tragedy to have to study something else. Now the question becomes, how do you get the time? And that's the problem. That's the hard part. You know, the elephant in the room, too, is also that if, you're, if we're talking about art beyond a certain kind of consumption, mm -hmm. right? I mean, I l really teach and got a PhD and do my work so I don't have to answer anyone in my art, right? Like, I make whatever I want, I don't care what it is. Like, believe me, because I, can, I have a skill set. I can teach literature. I can do these, th it was a second job. I actually don't have a fine arts degree, I have an MA from NYU and I have a PhD. I have no art training because I don't want that work. I don't want anyone to touch my mom in that way. I, 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 but if, if it's so, I think that part of it is me, me understanding that the, the, the other work, I, my very first teacher was Ishmael Reed at Berkeley. And he said, Bernal, don't be afraid of a job just washing dishes. Because if you're washing dishes, you can, just, you can just do that and then do your work later. And I always thought of that, like there is, a way to protect your work because I know intuitively and also that the work I'm making is priceless. I can trade up on a way to a co completely different career in, in, in art making because I know gallery, I don't know the galleries, but I know quality of work and I know that I could work at scale and I have a story that's interesting. That I'm, I don't mind selling, right? Because I'm interested in it, but I'm stable. I wouldn't make those decisions as a young person, but to have a home, to have a car, to have a husband, to have things that I think are stable means that I can foray in making a certain kind of, a different kind of what wealth. Because I want to help people, right? Like if, yeah. I, if I see Mark Bradford selling, you know, a painting. I mean, I'm not in that world, but if like some, if something's selling for 2.2 million dollars or whatever it is, or 200 thousand dollars, like I can actually be like, okay, let me just figure out this way to build something out of this make, because I don't mind it, and it sells, and it's it's different. It's un But writing, I I have a different relationship to. I guess all I'm saying, too, is I, I'm, I'm, I'm aligned with it protecting your art at all costs, and the double major might be saving your life. Toni Morrison got up at 5 o'clock in the morning to write before her kids came home, and she was an editor until, mm -hmm. you know, after her first book had come out. And I think she was working on the second, and her publisher said, you know, you really should devote your time to writing. 
um, Lucille Clifton used to write short poems while she was ironing. So, and I don't say that's ideal, right? Um, June Jordan did tons of work. She also died of cancer, probably because she was stressed out of, I, I mean, just, <laughs> it was torture on her. Jimmy Baldwin dies of stomach cancer, tries yeah. to kill himself. Yeah. I mean, multiple times. Yeah. So, I, I guess I say this to say, you do have to take care of your body and your health and minimize the stress as much as you can. Um, at the same time that you, part of taking care of yourself is being able to write or being able to make your art. Um, but you also have to have a place It just, at this retreat called Cave Canem, where I was a younger writer, I remember both Lucille and Sonia saying, you know what, we're waiting for you. Mm. Mm. Yes. And I'll add that, you know, we're She's waiting for terrific you. Writer. Terrific. And, and it's just like, also like, it's. I met you one time. I know. Yeah. And part of it is how do you witness your own, and I'm not saying this like witness your, in the tacky way, but like, how do you witness the profundity of the stuff you make? Because that's the stuff that also, you have to be prepared to understand what the relationship to your greatness is and making it, and it's powerful alone. It's the fear of being taken out. Here's a story I'm going to tell you, and I'm not going to cuss because I can't cuss. <laughs> oh, it's pub. Are you trying to give me fire, Steve? Thanks. <laughs> I'll see you outside. I know. I'll like, see what? you out back. So <laughs> someone said something to me, did something, right? I was at, at God, how am I going to tell this story and not identify the, the place? So I was somewhere doing something. I was gainfully employed, right? Community of people. Someone does something mighty shady. But then the expectation is that I'm not going to be mad. Mm -hmm. And so the first time, the person's like, oh, well, we weren't trying to hurt you. And I'm like, mm hmm OK, I heard you. She was shocked. She goes, what? I said, no, I heard you. Got it. Next week, I'm sitting. By this point, I'd had three mixed drinks. And I'm sitting writing something, and she comes up to me. She goes, oh, you know, the point is, we didn't mean to. We weren't trying to hurt you. We didn't mm. intend to offend you. And I looked at her, and I said, huh. I said, you do realize that I don't give a about your intentions. She was so mad mm. and so shocked. And one friend described this to me and said, Tanya, you burned that bridge. Mm -hmm. And I said, no, mm -hmm. she burned that bridge mm -hmm. and then blew the ashes and smoke in my face and wanted me to act as if there was still a bridge. 
And so what I said, what I understood in that moment was that I didn't have to pretend anymore. That I had to call it what it was mm -hmm. for my own sin. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right? Mm -hmm. And so I feel like there are times that we expend a lot of energy interacting with our projections onto other people. And that's not to say there aren't there aren't numbers of Karens and white men who are waiting to judge you and assess you and tell you and dismiss you. Not saying that at all. What I'm saying is that their power lies in a performance of civility and in our being complicit in protecting them from their own monstrosity. And so what if, what if we were here? We can't do it when we're surrounded by cops with guns. We can't do it. There are all these circumstances where it really is a threat to your life. But there are so many others where it isn't. We've never been there consciously. But who's... Well, well, let me let me ask you a question in terms of just the way that you're you're in you're in an institution that values the archive, mm -hmm. right? I mean, what you're talking yes. about is you're 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 recognizing a number of of possible impossible scenarios, which aren't new ideas, thank goodness, but they're process over time. I hear the refrain of what you're getting at through Baldwin. I hear it through Adrian Piper, I hear it through Gwendolyn Brooks, and I'll tell you why. Because the actual practice in the art making in all of the folks I've mentioned includes not only the primary work, but the archiving of the work. Mm -hmm. By archiving, I mean, what would happen if you wrote an essay about your playwriting performance? And maybe you did. But what would happen if you decided to commit to writing a series of letters that may be go unanswered to the black person who never showed up. What are the ways that you could write a, a number of, of, of formal inquiries into the very question of caretaking as a mode that actually begins to make your body of work? Because that's, I, I don't know you, but I feel like I, as if, if, if you're, you're coming with such open I think a real question, and my real answer to you would be, you must do the work of accounting for your curiosities and building your body of work around your body of work. Because this is what the great writers and great people do. They have catalogs, they record everything, they document everything. Even this conversation is now, check it, it's a part of a, it, an archive. Your question is a part of the, one of the most esteemed archives in the world in poetry and poetics. In this moment, you can return to this. At any moment in your life, you've documented this conversation between us. And where does it leave? Publish it! You know what I mean? That's right. I publish it in a minute. I publish stuff all the time, like for queer theory, black this or that. I'm like, okay, let's get a pop and send me the essay now. It, you know, because I think part of it is that is what your job is. Your job is to make formal in make formal decisions that will help you to thicken those questions it's, it's they're not they're not new questions i don't say that because they what does it mean to have your heart broken that's the blues hmm. right are are you singing the blues are you listening to the blues are you a singer can you make a song out of it can you try if you don't can you theorize the blues it's just like <laughs> you're singing the blues right now you are in a, if, if I were the guy you're afraid of, they're like, oh my gosh, you're repeating yourself. But I'm like, this is the blues. You're singing the blues to us. We could sit, no one could be in the room, but 
you're singing this story. We take care of, we wipe them, we wipe them down. We've done, I'm tired. <laughs> um, we wipe them, we've done this. We've taken their humanity. We wipe them, we've taken, you know what I'm saying? You are in a circular relationship and that loop is what has, that's important. Mm. That's a document. And how do you build and make palpable the body within the institution? Because you know what? It does pay, right? Because it pays in that you have something that's transferable for other people to learn from and to articulate. All the little woes that document journals, everything, every single thing. And that's the attention to the self. Mm -hmm. The self and the psyche. This is brilliant. I mean, this is really brilliant. And that idea of make your work, it's like what Bernice Reagan mm -hmm. says in that conversation with Sonia Sanchez, do your work and your audience will find you. Mm -hmm. And so that sense of no matter what, that oh really, it's so not about you, it's about my perception of what happened. I'm going to write about that. Or it's mm -hmm. about who I imagine you are, I'm gonna write about that. There's just so many loops, right? I, I, I will say this one little thing. The archives of Gwendolyn Brooks are, the one portion of them is at the Bancroft Library, just over the hill or over the bridge or whatever. But I went there before they were released to the public because I just had this hunch. I, I wrote this little grant. I was teaching at Mount Holyoke. And then there were just boxes, and Gwendolyn Brooks boxes. I'm opening boxes. I'm like, should I be touching this? Now, I had safe passage for a number of reasons, right? You know, and one was I was presentable. I, you know, I knew how to get, you know, I knew how to get into a room. So I'm in the room with Gwendolyn Brooks and stuff, and I open this stuff up, and it begins to fall apart. Mm. And there are, check this out. There were, maybe they're still there, but I was looking at checkbooks. I was looking at things that were literally just, and the most interesting, I was all about her laundry bills, right? But that's the archive. She's so, I was so committed as a scholar that I wanted that thing, kind of like what you're talking. It may seem like this thing that's not important, but every single thing creates a journey that may be possible in terms of, the wrong word is the archive. It might be the record. It might be the feeling. There's something else I think you're getting at in your question. But I'm here to say, or we're both here to say, that there's potential both in the act of scholarship, but also in the act of creation. A play is a play, mm -hmm. right? I mean, I write plays, but I, I don't actually expect to, you know, maybe they'll be staged, but the act of making a play is a very interesting formal practice that doesn't really need, an, it doesn't really need I mean, many of us have never seen a, a, a Shakespeare play, a Othello live, you know, in Bra it, but still we go to this, sorry to bring up, you know, the, you know, the granddaddy of them and all. look at Roxy Gay in uh, Shakespeare, right? Mm -hmm. There are all those brilliant writers in conversation. If not a note, an overture. If not a note, a whole. If not an overture, a desecration is Gwendolyn Brooks's boy breaking back. Mm. Mm. That, yeah, it's almost nine o'clock. Oh, oh, love you. Thank you Thank all you for, for showing up. Thank you for coming to live. <laughs>